45 minutes, but we didn't want you to stop. So we're, we're thankful for the Q&A session because this allows us to ask direct questions to get direct answers to things that you really want to know about concerning you. Because everybody has, you know how when you go for Bible study, they're talking about Sarah and Abraham, and you're saying, okay, what about Abolade? Let's leave Sarah and Abraham alone for a second. So this is your chance to ask a question that concerns you. So I'd let uh, Miss Harris ask the first question. I can't call her Miss now that she says she's been in one church for 21 years. Everybody knows her age. This <laughs> 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 has an extra set of eyes that they can follow. <laughs> Well, the first question we have, um, please, if you want to write your questions down, the papers and pen will pass, or if you want to say from the microphone, that's fine. You said our best strategy is to find a clear understanding of where God has called us to. How can we confirm where, where we're supposed to be? We tend to overthink this question. But when the Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord, we walk in faith in understanding how the Lord orders our steps. My rule is, wherever you find yourself, apply yourself the best in that location, even as you are asking the Lord to order your steps and to lead you to where he wants you to. Whatever you're doing that you know is in line with the Word of God, and how is something in line with the Word of God? Does it tick the righteousness box? Is it blessing humanity? Is it enhancing the people around you? Is it adding value? That you continue to do as you are checking it also with the desires of your heart. Because the Lord will always burden you with certain things. The things that you see that annoy you every day, that every time you see you're like, gosh, I wish they would do it this way. I wish they would do that that way. The things you are the one that is always thinking of how it can be done better. You will know that there's something that draws you to the place. And if you're also sitting in a place and you have no peace, that can't be God. Because the mark of the presence of God in the place is the peace of God. And you will know because you will you know it's every man every woman and her God it's between you and your God and there's a way you know when you're in the will of God because you will find you have peace and you will prosper in it now it doesn't mean you will not have troubles in the place that is your purpose but you will also know that you're meant to be there at that point in time. It's a journey you walk with God every day and as you're prayerfully asking God for direction, you will learn to hear his voice. For each person is different. For some, it's through instructions and for some, you seek counsel. But I always say that counsel is not instruction, it's information. The Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. So, we seek counsel in order to have a 360 degree view of a situation. But the decision concerning what we will do in line with the will of God for us can only be made by us. Because the spirit of God within you will bear witness with that situation that that is what the Lord has asked you to do. And you will know because you will have peace. Thank you very much. Um, we're passing paper and pen around for those who do not want to stand up to ask their question. Please write your question and pass it to the front. Thank you. We have a question from the back. And um, Pastor Chichi Manny, let me bring it right to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I was very reluctant to ask this question, but 
She's brought the microphone to me. I want to thank God for uh, Pastor Taiwo, first of all, and then for Pastor Sfaduba and what I've heard in this place tonight. My question is this. What if you get to a point in your life where you're convinced that this is what God wants you to do at this time, but you're under your spiritual parents who claim that God hasn't told them that that's what you should do? How do you balance doing what you're convinced God wants you to do and acting in rebellion against your spiritual fathers? This is a relay race because our second microphone isn't working. Okay, need to ask questions. Okay. Okay. Well, I will not be quoted as saying that you should walk in rebellion. However, 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 with all due respect to all the servants of God in the house, there's only one person accountable for the call of God on your life. That's you. It's not your pastor. <laughs> It's not your father or your mother. Everybody can give you counsel. Everybody can give you guidance. Everybody can give you information. And like I said earlier, counsel is what? It's information. Counsel allows you to have all the necessary information to look at the situation with a 360 degree view. However, the final decision as to what you will do in a situation is yours. And you are the one that is accountable to God for that call. No matter what, now that doesn't take away the fact that sometimes, you know, authority sees things you might not see. But if you do something without conviction, what is it? A sin. That's what the Bible says. So you must, if you have a situation like that, what you need to do is pray. But if you pray for a season and you're convinced in your heart that that's what it is, and there's nothing else that speaks to you that says that's not what you should be doing, you must respectfully move on with your conviction. Because at the end of the day, it is your life and you're accountable to God. As long as what you want to do is not outside the word of God, it's not sin, and it's not against the law. So those are things that you can't. But even parents who act like fathers must learn sometimes to step back and let the children find their way. If they give you the guidance and you do not receive it, or it doesn't bear witness with your own spirit. Pray about it, and if you get to your own place of peace, respectfully, I said, you must go to them. I always say to children who want to do something else other than what their parents, I say, go and kneel down at your father's feet and beg him to let you live your life and let you pursue what you believe is right for you. Look, the only reason I was able to go ahead with furniture manufacturing was because my father, I don't even know, I would say he had faith, but this was a man who had every reason to just want me to get a job like every young woman in the 80s. And then I come home and say, I want to go into manufacturing. Wait, how many manufacturing companies succeeded in Nigeria then, let alone of a young girl wanting to do manufacturing. But my father had enough wisdom and grace to give me the space for my adventure. And he stood back and watched me. You know, one of the biggest things I did in my business life was four years into my business, I took a major loan because I really just needed, I was desperate to move the business forward and I just, who was going to, which bank was giving a young girl money there? And one of my clients, who just took to me, offered to give me a one million naira loan in 1993 through a finance company. If they would take the deposit from him, 
give me the money, but it was a finance company that had responsibility to him, and I would have to pay them back. Every 90 days, I had to pay part of capital and interest. My father knew. He didn't discourage me. 15 months after, when I had managed to pay back that money, was when I discovered what my father's plan was. Apparently, he had told everybody, they will be, you know, for those that are not Yoruba people, he said that they are giving birth to this one <laughs> and prepared himself that if anything went wrong, he would sell his house and pay off the debt. But luckily, he didn't have to because I did manage to pay the money and move on. So as parents, and I speak to all the parents in the house, don't leave your dreams through your children. Yeah. Leave your own dreams and let them leave theirs. And sometimes they will make mistakes. Counsel, guide, lead. But when they get to a place of conviction, if it's not something that will kill them, let them do it. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Okay, we have another question and then I'll... Come on up. Good evening. Um, so... I hesitate to ask this question because I saw on Instagram your um, clip about failure and how you said failure is rubbish and you know you learn from your mistakes. But I really want to know though, have you ever failed failed <laughs> in business or in your career? Like you had an opportunity to do something and you feel like you didn't hit the mark and you feel like you were maybe set back a few steps from where you thought you were going to be from that opportunity. How did you recover from that and rebuild your confidence to move forward? So those are one of those questions that I don't believe in. So I tend not to answer it like that. And it's simply, let me tell you the thing that failure is. It's a mindset and it's a destructive mindset. Sorry, this is where I get up. <laughs> The Bible says in the world you will see troubles. So without a doubt, nobody promised you a perfect life. Without a doubt, there is no journey that is straight and smooth. I wouldn't employ you for a high level office if you haven't learned how to deal with challenges. Because it means you're not qualified. It says to me, if there's crisis now, you wouldn't know how to respond. This is the truth. And at the highest level of employing top-line people, and I do have quite a number working under me in different places, those are things you actually look out for. So when you talk about failure, it's how you perceive and you box situations. So there are things we try out. My belief system, life is an adventure. In an adventure, you're ready for surprises. So sometimes, some things would not work the way you assumed that it will. One thing business teaches you is, like Pastor Mrs. said, you always think things are going to work one way. Do you know what? The best business plan in the whole wide world is what? It's a bundle of assumptions. If you go and read your business plan, at the back, you list all the assumptions made. What are assumptions? They're not facts. They're things you are still will be. And if there's a change in any of the assumptions, it would affect your projections and how you expect things to play out. Which is why the Bible says you should not despise the days of humble beginnings. Why? Because starting small allows you to adjust and amend when things don't work as you've planned it. So in life as well, as you walk through situations, some things will not work. But guess why you get tied up in the box of failure? Other people. Because what is making you feel that you failed is because of how the people around you are reacting to it. Damn everybody else. And face your life. What you learn from what hasn't worked they haven't learned. The lessons you pick up from there, they only make you stronger. They prepare you, they strengthen you. In 30 years of business, is it possible that I have not encountered different things? It's absolutely impossible. I have five companies running, 
three factories running. So obviously, the crisis moments, the days that you almost think, gosh, how are we going to continue? But they that know their God. See, listen, don't be a child of God and live like a non-child of God. Because we tend to think we're Christians in church, but we're meant to be Christians every second of our life. So the word of God is not just true when your pastor is preaching. It's meant to be true when you're standing alone facing the wall. Which is why when I told you the best strategy of your life is that you understand who you are in Christ, that you know your location, and that you know the word. Because when you do, when something isn't working, you will have enough courage to say, this isn't working and you walk away. Or because sometimes what seems like it's not working just needs a little more time. And you will not run before you get to that time. Because the Holy Spirit will keep you calm enough to weather the storm. If you are going through a particular business and there are challenges, every other person in that industry is probably encountering the same problem. Guess who is going to rule that business? The guy who stays long enough to overcome. Everybody that drops off will leave their portion of the field behind. The guy who stays long enough will own the field. It is the word of God that gives you the strength to stand. If that is the place of your calling, you will know you shouldn't run away. Even though it's not working, you will stay with it. Why? Because the Lord will give you grace and he will keep you calm. And he will assure you that just wait a little longer. You don't know why, but you have the courage to trust him. And because you trust him, day will break and you will have your victory. Amen. And if it's a place where you have taken a wrong turn and it's not a place where you should be, you will also know. And from that place, the Lord will take you from there to the next place. Amen. I told you how I got into furniture manufacturing. I had never thought about it. Nobody in my father's line was <laughs> manufacturing furniture. It was not an idea I thought of. I did not write a business plan. I had no dream, no ambition, nothing for it. But I did a detour. I thought... I did a detour to kill time for three and a half months. It's a 30 year story. So where is the failure? Because when I went to work in that furniture company, a lot of my friends got jobs in banks. And I was still waiting to get my bank job. And there were many moments of my suffering through manufacturing that I wished I was them. <laughs> But I kept with it because I was sure I was called to be there. Now, I'm in the banking, aren't I? <laughs> well, guess what? I came straight from the top. Look, when is God? You? The ways of God, they're like foolishness to men. So don't let anybody ever tell you you are failed at anything. I'm serious when I say that. And it's why I take time to, when I'm talking to young people, I'm very clear about this failure issue. Because I've seen a lot of smart young people get buried. So something doesn't work, so what? So it fails three, four times, so what? How long did it take the guy who found the bulb to do it? 900 and something times. If it would take that long for something to succeed, there are few people that would do it. Yes. If you are called to that place by God, He's the only one that can give you the grace to stay with it long enough to excel. Yes. And you will shine. Yes. I'm the chairman of a bank, but I'm a business person. So I sit there with the eyes of a business person. If I came through the banking career, I would be a different kind of chairman. Yes. I would be a different person. And my entire work and profile is different from the normal person because I came from a different room. And that's my value that I add to yeah. Praise the Lord. Um,
this is Aushiro. We have another question here. How have you managed to juggle the various aspects of your life? The various no, the various aspects of your life as a wife, a mother, a business owner, and all of that. And um, and you consider yourself successful in all of these areas, or just some section of it. My agenda in life is not to be successful in some section of my life. My agenda in life is to be successful on all fronts of my life. And my biggest dream in life is to die empty. Yes, without any talent or giftings of God that I have, that I have not used or applied. So, I'm 56 now, so I still have a lot of years of life. So success is at the end of the race. That's how I measure. But at this point in time, I have three children. My first is 28 now. It's finished from King's College London, back home, working, is doing well. My second is will be 25 soon. Finished from University of Edinburgh, back home and working. My baby is 17. As at this second is in rugby, is on rugby tour in South Africa. Uh, and is in one more year of A levels, yeah. and then it goes to uni. And as far as I know, I've never missed. I've had kids in school in England for thirteen years. I never missed a parents meeting wow. or exit. So my husband is my friend, and he's a good man. Right. And I married a good man. That's right. And I'm very grateful to God for that. Yeah. So. My counsel for the, how many single girls are in the house? If you're single, okay, there are too many married people here. Yeah. <laughs> there are a few single ladies. Okay, you're in the best time of your life, so nothing, that's no, nothing, no offense meant. But the value of the fact that you're still single is you get the chance to make the right decisions. Don't marry a fool. That's for sure. And when I say don't marry a fool, it means don't marry a man who does not fear God, nor a man who, or a man who has no capacity to accommodate your vision and your ambition. A lot of girls are caught up with this wedding thing in terms of wearing the wedding dress and the ceremony. And therefore, they don't do their homework. You don't consider the right things. It's not even about the money, because you can always make your own money. Right. It's not about he's tall, rich, and handsome. If you feed him enough, he'll be fat and fat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, no, that's not... His father is somebody. In Nigeria, people are in position today, they're out of position tomorrow. So that's no big deal. So those are not your real factors. The things you need to consider is a man that fears the Lord, because there are many things that he will not do because he fears God. That's really important. Two, a responsible human being. And when you say responsible, it doesn't mean that he's the one footing all your bills. Because it takes a team. And you can always work as a team together to achieve whatever you want. But it's important that you marry a man who has the capacity to accommodate who you are. And I think if the greatest thing that God did for me, apart from everything else, is that in the course of life, it helped me to make the right decision where that was concerned. Because okay. people used to say I was too smart and too ambitious for my own good. And they were sure that I would marry an elderly person. And I didn't care. <laughs> I just knew that I wasn't ready to sacrifice what I wanted for my life. To just marry. Yeah. And, well, as it turned out, my husband is only four years older than me. So I didn't marry an old man. <laughs> <laughs> I married a guy. <laughs> and he's my friend, he's my husband, he's my lover, he's my boyfriend. And the beauty of it is when we met, all I had was a manufacturing company and he was a petroleum engineer working in NMPC. There's no way, as ambitious as people thought I was, and he could see my drive. There's no way he could have imagined me now. That's just the truth. But because God helped me to choose the right man, my husband had the capacity, as he grew in life, he grew with the capacity to accommodate 
the woman I emerge to be. And that makes all the difference. Because we're a team. I'm here, my husband knows I'm here. That's just it. We work as a team. So yes, my home works. Because I married the right guy. So if you want to make sure that you can do all of those things, it works. As for business and life, somebody asked me, okay, you asked me, that how do I cope with all my other businesses? You must learn to delegate in life. There's no superwoman. She doesn't exist. Two, you cannot think that nothing will happen without you. Are you God? It's foolishness. So for me, everybody that works around me is fully empowered. I don't think I've seen the checkbook in my group for years. It's not my business. The people set up the systems, set up the structure, find the talents, empower them because if you die, life continues. Yeah. So why do you act as if you're never going to die? You know, and I was strategic in doing that. From when I was 31, I made up my mind that I wanted to have a life as I wanted to build my business. So from then, I would take a six weeks holiday in the summer and tell the business, it's you guys' problem. Wherever you are, when I come back, we'll continue. I used that to train my people to develop, to run without me. And over time, it was important for me to find the right kind of people to work in the business and to give them trust as a gift. You must learn to trust other people to do things. But you trust them and you let create systems of checks and balances that makes things work so that you don't set them up for trouble as well. So having done that, I let the business run. I face my life. I have other priority in my life. Number one is God. When I say God, I don't say church. I say God. Because God is with me here. God and I travel everywhere. Come on. After God is my family. My husband and my children. Surrounded with the rest of my household. My family. Then, my business, my career, all of that. And then, church. And church does not mean I am not committed to church. For those who are used to Fountain, they would know I've been in my church for 28 years. For as long as Fountain has existed, I was in the fellowship that led to Fountain. And I headed the business fellowship in church from day one to like a few years ago. But this is the time and season of my life where I cannot even be in church every Sunday. And I have no apologies about it. Why? Because I'm going about my father's business. Yeah. I'm here now. What am I doing? Preaching. So there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I have total liberty and understanding of my call. And I know that I'm going about my father's business. So I have no... Tomorrow I will... Now I'm in America. That's six hours, man. That's a problem. Otherwise, I just connect to church. And I listen to my pastor preach and I watch the service. So I'm in church. My pastor knows. Because half the time he say, I'm sure Pastor Blessing is watching. Because he knows I'm not there, but you say something that will affect me and I will know. So you have to find who you are in Christ. You must be comfortable with your own call. You must understand your own assignment. And I know that the place of business is a pulpit for me. Because when you understand the place of your career or business to be a pulpit, you handle it differently. You handle it with the consideration that a pastor will give to the things he's preaching at church. Because the word of God and the flag of God must be flown and flown right. Thank you. So we're probably going to be having a couple of more questions, two more questions, and then we can. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. All right, um, we have a follow-up question to the last question asked, and then the sister in the back will be the next question. So, ask a question, My, my follow-up question is, as an ambitious woman as you are, and you talked about delegating, what were some mental ceilings you had to cross as a woman or a mother in your home to be able to accomplish all these things because 
I will assume that you are not always there to make dinner for your husband or cook or do things like that. Where there are certain mental ceilings you had to cross as an uh, African woman to be able to accomplish some of these things you mentioned. And delegation, how did you do that? And the last question. Okay, okay yeah. good evening. Um, I wanted to, first of all, appeal to you because I know you mentioned about mentoring women, young women between the 20, ages of 25 and 35. Some of us that are approaching 40, especially those of us that want to go back to Nigeria, you know, if you can also consider. And um, for my question that I wanted to ask, how did you identify and approach mentors that probably helped you with growing your business? I think um, as she was asking for the age group on uh, 40 and above or whatever, um, there's also another question that was saying uh, a lot of our children here right now are getting into business, being an entrepreneur, and they, they would love to have someone like you come back to speak to the young ones in their 20s as well. So the question just asks if you can always come back. I'm going to throw my question in there right quick. Um, um, I noticed that... Um, as it were, this platform is more of a church platform, and it, it's almost as if um, you have to let people see the hand of God, and now you press towards the ladder of prominence. Um, but I've, I've listened to your message as well, and there's different seminars. You're a key speaker to many seminars. So how do you, as it were, address the professional path of things without making it all Hey, she's an issue, she knows what she's saying, so we can listen to her situation. <laughs> How do you approach that skills and ethics in the world where people, secular people that come to listen to you, what kind of things do they get from you as well in your speeches as well? You know, the truth is the truth. And um, you can still talk about how things are done without necessarily preaching. Yeah. So, I still, I told you stories. Those stories are real, and the power behind it is Christ, and I know that. And in a gathering like this, I have the liberty of expression to say that. In a world conference of anywhere, I would be speaking, depending on whatever the topic is, from whatever perspective, to the substance of the conversation without, and, however, I am never ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have sat, I, I know, okay. So if, let's talk about like, I know a lot of people, because someone's asked me about the governor's speech that I made to the governors. I'm never afraid to bring in Christ. If you take your mind back, if anyone listened to the speech I made to the governors, mm -hmm. there's a point where I said, look, I'm a Christian. And then I made the statement with the reference of it. So I will give you the substance of the, of the comment and say, from my perspective as a Christian, this is what I believe. And this is what this means in the context of what I am saying. So when I find it, there are moments I get to I have those kind of moments. I bring it up. But otherwise, I'm speaking to the substance. And at that point, is a test of your intellect and your ability to deliver on the subject. And that, that for me, is still by the Holy Spirit. But to them, is the ability of a good speaker. So it's to each one is own. So that means that's nothing. Now, um, I want to take the different parts of your the mentorship thing. You know, when I was started, I started my business in 1989. Mentorship was not such a big thing as it is now. I remember that what I used to do is I used to buy books of great business people and read about them and their experiences and things they did. And I used to learn from that. And one of the, um, the books that helped me to find my path of building a righteous business was actually a book written by um, a guy based in Georgia, Larry Bucket. Oh. Business by the book or business? Yes. It was after I read that book, I actually came to America, went to Georgia, and went to their ministry there 
I uh, can't remember what the name of the place is in Georgia. I went there, I made a deal with them and brought them to Nigeria. And we ran seminars with them for Nigerian Christians in business for a while. And it helped my business ministry because thereafter I started teaching. And I had a TV program for seven years where I was teaching about building businesses way. So it, it's, um, I learned because I sought knowledge as well. And you looked for examples around the world, even if you didn't have some immediate ones around you. And along the line, there were moments where I needed help, and I sought whoever had the knowledge, whether male or female. And I asked questions. And I was very curious and inquisitive. And the other thing for me is knowledge. You know, the Bible says we must seek knowledge. In seeking knowledge, we must seek understanding. So I'm an addict of knowledge. I'm always in school. Every year I go to school, every single year. You know, I went back at 37 to business school, finished business school, went back, worked for a while, then went back again and did the global CEO program. And every year in between until today, I go back to school even if it's a five day course or a two day course. As far as I know right now, I'm registered to be in Singapore for one week in November to go to school. So it's, for me, it's, uh, it's a habit. Why? Because life is so dynamic now. Knowledge is power and is key. And you cannot say because you're a Christian, you will not know your stuff. You must be on top of your game. You have to be diligent. You have to be an expert in your field. And you must have the knowledge that the Holy Spirit will work with in order to make you excel. So you must study to be approved. That is your own responsibility. Nobody else can do that for you. Uh, the next question is about how do I manage the cooking or not cooking? <laughs> Mental. See, there's no... We create all these boxes. There are stages in our lives. Obviously, when my husband and I first got married, it's just the two of us. We had a houseboy that used to clean and all of that. So I used to cook. And uh, then gradually, you're getting busier. And uh, you also realize that your husband can eat food that's not cooked by you. <laughs> so rea reality of, uh, of resets. And um, you know the good husbands, Mr. Harris, where are you? <laughs> the good husbands also have wisdom. Let, let, let's discuss something. You know, the Bible says that your wife is your helper. The quality of the help you will get from your wife depends on the quality of the helper you have allowed to emerge. And you will not know the quality of the helper you have until your day of trouble. Because if you have buried your helper and you have not allowed her talents and her ability to emerge and to be nurtured, you lose. It's your loss. Because it meant that God gave you a gift and you decided to minimize the gift rather than maximize it. If you maximize your gift, you can only be blessed by it. Yes. Without any apologies, I am certain that I'm value added to my husband's life. Yes. Without any apologies. Even as I am grateful every day for the husband that is mine. But, do you even know my father's name? Yes. I asked. Maybe the MG girls who know my maiden name. Yes, because you are in one of those who knew it, the MG girls. But, otherwise, Awashika. Did the Awashika pay my school fees? <laughs> <laughs> my father did. But, I carry the name of another across the world. I don't apologize for it. I proudly carry a great family name. Because they are a great family. And I'm, I'm grateful for the kind of family that they are. Because I've never seen a family so proud of their wives 
as if they were born by them. That is the truth. They are exceptional as a family in that. And they will tell us, the wives, that you have every right, like every member of this household. And I remember, the, about, I think, a Christmas party like two or three years ago. They were deliberating, celebrating their women. The two of us, I'm chairman of First Bank. The acting chairman of Access Bank is another Mrs. Awashika. Wow. It's true. The two of us, and the, the, the current chairman will retire at the end of the year. She will most, most likely just take over. So you will have to Mrs. Awashika of, in the top four banks in Nigeria. The chairman of Standard Chartered Bank is half Awashika, half Adikbetu. One family, there'll be three banks that are chaired by, yes, and then two women of them. So the real, what I'm saying is, nurture your wife, give her the space to be the best of herself. It can only add to you, it cannot take away from you. And so when a man has wisdom, and your wife emerges in those places, you would give her the space to emerge. And if in that space, what is key about eating? That there's food on the table. <laughs> I live in Nigeria. Who cares who cook it? Maybe my cook can cook better than I can. Because I don't cook everything. So if I even have to cook. So when will I cook for my husband? We have a country home in England. When we're on holidays and we're in a place together, and I always take my money. So if we're there and my nanny is not there and we want to eat, yes, I will cook for my husband. But not because I don't want to cook for my husband, but my life on an everyday basis cannot allow it. And reality is that a good man, like Mr. Harris, <laughs> And the good man in the house <laughs> celebrates them. And the many good men in the house, like my husband, will understand that and allow me the space. I'm here now, I'm a blessing to you only because my husband had me allow the space, allowed me the space not to be running the altar skeleton to get home to cook his dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. Important thing is, all the grocery must get into my kitchen. Yeah. Nobody needs to know how it gets there. Yeah. It's my responsibility to set up a system that works. Yeah. And that system says, food gets there. It's nobody's business how it gets there. Yeah. That system says, food gets on the table. It's nobody's business how food gets on the table. Do you understand? The rest of it, I'm raising children. What do I need? Nannies. And support. You understand? My mother-in-law lived with me for 20 years, by the way. Yes. Because my husband, my husband loves his mother, therefore I love her. Me, I have three sons. So, and I know young girls now are always praying that mothers will die. You yeah. are not about to die for anyone. <laughs> so, I treated my mother-in-law well for 20 years. So, I'm certain that my daughter-in-law will have to be. You understand? So, it is really about work out your own salvation. Work out what works for you. Work out the system that allows you to be all that you need to be and work it out with your own husband. It's different for each couple. Work it together and make sure it works. Build a team. And most times is how we approach it too. Approach it well. Win your husband off the things that make your life difficult by conversation. I know you guys live in America. All the house help and everything is not readily available here. But there are ways to do it as well. Work out your own salvation. I don't know what it is. Otherwise, come back home. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, so I was only talking about the project of 25 to 35, but 
I work with most women. It's not, uh, I don't even get it. They don't give me a chance to escape that anyway. So it's just I have a particular passion for 25 to 35. Because if you help them to understand things right early, it's easier. You don't have to spend a lot of time correcting a lot of stuff. And I have a particular project. I've been working on that for about four years now. And we're still working on and I love what we've done in that space. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, can you give Mr. Washika a round of applause? Thank you so much. And a lot of blessing for that work.